All right, I think I'm on. Good morning, everyone. It is my greatest pleasure to welcome you to the February 2021 COVID-19 Inventor Showcase, a partnership between the Center for Clinical and Translational Science, OSU Corporate Engagement Office, Office of Technology and Commercialization, and Nationwide Children's Hospital. I am Dorota Brzezinska, the Associate Dean for Research at the College of Engineering, and also Senior Associate VP for Research, where my focus is on corporate and government partnerships. I have to share with you, I just reached my 25th uh, year milestone at Ohio State, so you can certainly say I am a Buckeye for life. <laughs> My own research has focused on the science and application of the global positioning system and subsequently integration of GPS with other means of navigation and positioning to assure continuity, availability, <laughs> res and resilience of the positioning information in GPS challenge environments. The research performed by my team of graduate students and postdocs contributed over the years to the evolution of GPS from its early days of civilian applications to transforming it to the everyday utility. That's a professional journey I'm personally very proud of. A couple of decades of research and several years of national and international professional leadership and academic leadership service afforded me a broader perspective on contemporary science and engineering leadership landscape through the lens of a scientist. Well, in the past, I used to be a scientist, an active member of the National Academy of Engineering, um, the US President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and the National Space Based Positioning, Navigation and Timing Advisory Board. So I'm especially excited to be a part of the broader interdisciplinary ecosystem that has been evolving on our campus for several years. In my administrative roles, I work closely with TCO and corporate engagement and our corporate partners to help transform our campus into a collaborative space where students, academic researchers, economic development leaders, Fortune 500 businesses and new startups have the potential to share promising new ideas, accelerate their development and turn them into translational solutions. More than ever, the solution to the most complex research, technological and societal challenges are rarely best accomplished within one academic discipline and require contributions from multiple fields. One of the greatest examples of such collaboration is our response to the COVID pandemic. Faculty, students and staff from the College of Medicine, College of Engineering, Arts and Sciences and many, many other units on campus have come together to face this challenge. Another example I wish to offer of interdisciplinary collaboration that brings innovation to life from the bench to the bedside to improve human health is the recently established Center for Cancer Engineering, jointly sponsored by the College of Engineering and the James Comprehensive Cancer Center. This center serves, serves as a nexus where researchers from across campus, not just CCC James and engineering, work together to design, develop and integrate innovative engineering technologies, physical and data sciences, and other investigative approaches to advance the understanding of cancer to improve the lives of patients. The academic portfolio of the scientists and their teams who present at the COVID-19 Inventors Showcase are the prime example of team-based, cross and interdisciplinary research. And the focus of today's presentation is no different. And without any further ado, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen Dannemiller and her team. Karen's background combines both engineering and public health to tackle difficult questions with regards to exposures to the built environment. With a joint appointment between civil environmental and geodetic engineering and environmental health sciences, a courtesy appointment in microbiology and her role as a core faculty member in the Sustainability Institute, Karen is uniquely positioned to address complex problems found in our environments. She and her team have been at the forefront of using indoor environment monitoring to study the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I am privileged and honored to be able to introduce this incredible team and join you in applauding their work. Karen, over to you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for that introduction. And I really wanna thank the uh, team who coordinated and invited us to be here today to talk with all of you. We're really excited to talk with you about our work to develop a novel indoor monitoring technique for SARS-CoV-2 in the indoor environment and contribute to the fight against COVID-19. In this talk, we're going to first start out talking about viruses in the indoor environment and what we know about them. We're going to cover two recent studies that we've been working on and then talk about the practical implications and how these are already being implemented today. Uh, next, we're going to talk about two fantastic on campus resources. First, the Ohio supercomputer, which we often use to process our microbiome data. And second, the Sustainability Institute, of which Dr. Natalie Hall and I are both core faculty members. So this work is really about thinking about the future. We all hope that we're at a turning point in the COVID-19 pandemic. We have the vaccines being distributed and uh, people are being inoculated against uh, COVID-19. Uh, we also see the case numbers going down and we hope that that trend will continue. However, unfortunately, COVID-19 is unlikely to be eradicated in the near future and will continue to circulate among low levels among the population, even after vaccines have been distributed. This can be particularly problematic for high risk uh, communities, such as those people who are living in nursing homes and will continue to have a need for long-term monitoring. This will especially be necessary because there might be variants down the road that can evade the vaccines that we have. And there might also be individuals who don't have immunity either because they have not received the vaccine or because they were not able to develop an immune response to that vaccine. So right now, a lot of the surveillance strategies that we've been using have focused on individual testing. And on the right side of this, you can see uh, that we have done a lot of individual testing, but this uh, has high cost and high effort. And you can only really measure about one individual at a time, unless you're using pooled testing techniques. So this has been necessary and really important right now. On the other end of the spectrum, we've also seen a lot of success in terms of wastewater monitoring. And this is a way to monitor potentially millions of people in a sewer shed at the same time for low cost and low effort. What we were really focused on is an intermediate solution where you have a high risk cohort of people say living in a building together, such as a nursing home or perhaps a military barracks or somewhere where you really wanna be able to catch outbreaks quickly and stop them as soon as possible. It might not be feasible in the long term to continue the high cost and high resource intensive effort of individual testing. And so we need to develop more solutions for building scale monitoring. And that's what we were focusing on today. We felt that we were uniquely positioned to address this question. I direct the Indoor Environmental Quality Research Group here at Ohio State, and we study how microbes in the indoor environment impact human exposure. In the past, we've largely focused on fungi and bacteria. And when the COVID-19 pandemic impacted all of our lives, we really uh, decided that we needed to pivot and address viruses. We really appreciate all of our healthcare heroes and everyone else on the front line who has been fighting every day against this pandemic. And so we wanted to contribute anything we could to the knowledge about what's going on. So uh, I reached out to Dr. Natalie Hall from Ohio State and Dr. Kyle Bibby from Notre Dame, and we developed a collaboration to address the issue that I mentioned on the previous slide. So when we think about the indoor environment, we actually know that most of the spread of uh, the novel coronavirus occurs indoors. And this is because humans are very effective at shedding this virus into the indoor environment. You can see here from this picture of a man sneezing without a mask on, um, he's expelling all of these droplets into the indoor environment. And if he were to be infected with a coronavirus, each of these droplets would contain viral particles. So in thinking about this, we wanted to ask the question, where does this virus go? We know that the virus is gonna be present in different ranges of particle sizes. And in the larger particle sizes, it's gonna to tend to fall to the floor. In the smaller particle sizes, it's gonna to tend to be distributed around the room and to different areas. And so we wanted to think about where is this actually going in the indoor environment and how can we measure it? So to do this, we wanted to consider surface swabs. We also wanted to consider dust. 
And in our indoor environmental quality research, looking at other microbes, we have shown that dust is a really important microbial reservoir, especially related to human exposure. Uh, it is both a source and a sink. So wherever you are, wherever you're sitting now, you're shedding microbes and they are being deposited as a sink into the dust in that room. If you were to get up and walk around, you would then resuspend that and it would become a source of those microbes. We've also seen that other viruses have been present at high levels in floor dust. And so here I'm talking about the dust, you know, on our floors, the dust that you might collect with a vacuum cleaner. We've also seen that SARS-CoV-2 has been shown to be present on particulate matter. And so for this, we realized that we needed to look at the dust as a potential matrix for surveillance uh, for this novel virus. And we also needed to understand uh, potential viability of that virus in this system. So once again, we really wanted to target this question of can we develop an interim, an interim monitoring solution for the long-term future to understand and identify outbreaks early on that might occur in high-risk areas such as nursing homes or places where we really want to identify these outbreaks early in a very specific high-risk population that can help us save resources and money in terms of um, comparing that to individual testing. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole Renninger. She is a graduate student in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geodetic Engineering, and the first author on the manuscript um, for the work that we're going to highlight here to study SARS-CoV-2 and dust. Thanks. Uh, so as Dr. Dana Miller mentioned, we are really interested in this building level monitoring. So we're really interested in indoor dust as this matrix for surveillance of COVID-19. Here you can see a preprint that is currently out if anyone is interested in looking into it further. Um, and this is a paper that's currently under review. So again, the goal of this study was to look at dust as a matrix for the outbreak surveillance of COVID-19 and potentially also of other viral outbreaks. So in this study, we collected samples from the isolation rooms of students who had tested positive for COVID-19. We collected three different sample types, bulk floor dust, surface swabs, and passive uh, air samples, which were placed on the floor and just allowed air particles to deposit onto it. And what we were really looking for in these samples was the detection of COVID-19 RNA, which is different than infectivity. So to test for COVID-19 infectivity, something like a plaque assay would need to be done and requires a BSL-3 facility. For the purposes of monitoring, um, infectivity isn't necessary. So we used PCR technologies, which are the same used to monitor uh, wastewater, as well as some of the human rapid testing with nose swabs and saliva. And we looked at three different PCR methods, a quantitative PCR and two digital-based PCRs. And here's kind of a view of what our sampling looked like. So with surface swabs, we tested desk, laptop, bedside tables, bathroom, and doorknobs. You can see the passive sampler there on the floor. And then we also collected floor dust via vacuuming. So the darker red here indicates a higher number of RNA copies um, based on that sampling location. And averaged across our three different PCR methods, floor dust had the most RNA per sample type. And then looking at this graphic just a slightly different way in the blue, we looked at percentage of positive detects of our different sample types. So again, the darker blue represents more, a higher percentage of positive detects. And we found a very similar thing. So averaged across the three PCR methods, Florida had the highest percentage of positive detects with 88% of Florida samples testing positive for COVID-19. That's compared to about 57% of surface swabs and just under 50% of passive air samples. And on the higher end, um, looking specifically at digital droplet PCR, 97% of dust samples tested positive for COVID-19. So what we're really seeing, looking at both percentage of positive detects and our um, copies of RNA, is that dust appears to be this really efficient matrix for detecting COVID-19 RNA in the indoor space compared to these other sample types. So then looking further into dust, we decided to look at it over a period of time. So our COVID positive dust was kept sealed in vacuum bags within the lab space for a period of four weeks and tested weekly. So looking at graph A here in the upper left-hand corner, 
What we found was that the COVID-19 RNA in the dust did not measurably decay over this four week period, looking at any of our three PCR methods. So this may be important for surveillance to understand if you're detecting a recent outbreak or something that occurred in the past. And then looking at graphics uh, B through D, we also saw a pretty high variability in our RNA copies within our dust replicates. And this is likely due to the fact that we weren't able to homogenize the dust as we typically would due to biosafety concerns. So this may be something where multiple samples need to be taken in these indoor spaces to get a more robust idea of RNA concentration or a safe way needs to be developed to homogenize this dust without aerosolizing it and increasing exposure risks. Um, but that being said, we were still really surprised to see this RNA in the dust and its persistence in the dust. And this is especially surprising because these student isolation rooms that we took our samples from were sprayed with a disinfectant prior to the samples being collected. So this was a chlorine-based disinfectant. It's a non-selective oxidizer. It destroys proteins, but there's mixed literature on whether it's able to penetrate and degrade the RNA. So despite the application of this disinfectant in the room, it was sprayed, allowed to settle for about 20 minutes before dust was collected via vacuuming. We still saw, or we still were able to detect RNA and it was persisting for at least four weeks. So then kind of the next obvious question after we finished some of our surveillance work was, what is this viability in dust and on flooring? So I'm gonna it, pass it on to Nick Nastasi, who is a master's student in the environmental science graduate program. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, so as we just mentioned, we were able to detect RNA and dust uh, over a long period of time. Um, and as also mentioned, this is different than being infective. So detecting the RNA does not tell us essentially anything about the infectivity of the virus during that period of time. And to do this, we need to do a separate experiment to measure infectivity using plaque assays. On the figure to the right here is an example of one of these. It's basically an auger infused with a host bacteria. Uh, the sample is poured into the plate. And these little cavities you see is the virus actually infecting that bacterial host and causing a cavity. We then count these to uh, get a measure of infectivity in something called plaque forming units. So our goal for this is to figure out how long uh, the virus will stay viable in dust and on flooring. So as mentioned, we're not a BSL-3 lab, so we could not do anything with SARS-CoV-2. So we use two viral surrogates, uh, MS2 and 5-6 bacteriophage, and mixed it in a saliva solution. We then aerosolized this on the carpet and house dust. So we incubated these samples at varying time points. And then we perform these plaque assays to determine uh, the infectivity of the surrogates at each time point. This is an example of the apparatus that we use to uh, uh, nebulize the uh, saliva and viral solution onto the carpet and the dust. Basically, we put this uh, saliva solution into a nebulizer, turn it on for 15 minutes. This creates those fine droplets uh, as would be expelled in a sneeze, a cough, or even just breathing. Uh, the particles were then settled onto the carpet or dust um, and allowed to settle for 15 minutes and then put into the incubator at the varying time points. So here's an example of some of our results so far. This is for the 5-6 bacteriophage. So the time zero on this chart is basically nebulizing directly onto the carpet and immediately extracting the virus and determining the infectivity. And then you can see the time here in hours. We went all the way out to 48 hours. We did look at two fiber type constructions, a cut pile and a loop pile, which you can see on the right side of this graphic. Um, so you can see over time, the 5-6 is losing viability uh, in these carpets. Um, and by 48 hours, we did not see any uh, viral infectivity for 5-6. Uh, similar, this is the results for the MS2 bacteriophage. Again, we use the two different types of fiber construction. Um, again, we see a downward trend as time uh, increases and in losing infectivity. But we can see here a little bit of a difference because at 48 hours, 
we were able to still detect some viability in MS2, indicating that it does persist a little bit longer than the Phi6 bacteriophage. So there are some limitations to this. Uh, this is very much pre preliminary data, and we are still collecting the data as we speak. So the data I just shown was not peer reviewed yet, and we are still working on getting the uh, measurements for the house dust. So please just use this information cautiously and know that it is still a work in progress. And finally, I will turn it over to Dr. Natalie Hull, who will discuss the practical implications. Thanks, Nick. I'm Dr. Natalie Hall, an assistant professor in environmental engineering, and I have been thrilled to work with this team on this project. My expertise has been in water quality and doing a lot of testing with figuring out how to best disinfect viruses in water. So we, it's been a real treat to come together and bring our expertise together to respond to this quickly in the midst of this evolving pandemic because with rolling out vaccines and cases decreasing over time, but also considering potential emergence of resistant strains of the virus, as we have seen, there is going to continue to be need for monitoring of the virus in the environment so that we can make appropriate decisions about engineering interventions or other public health interventions to help keep people safe. One example of this type of monitoring that I've been involved with and that others have been doing across the globe is monitoring wastewater to get an idea of how much SARS-CoV-2 virus is in wastewater to help us monitor outbreaks. As you can see here from a Yale study, the concentration of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in wastewater for a given wastewater treatment plant aligns fairly well with clinical case data for COVID-19 infections. And in some cases, researchers have shown that wastewater can actually be an early warning sign because people start to shed the virus in their feces before they get symptoms and go in for a test. So it's an indicator of where we might need to apply more efforts to track down and pinpoint where outbreaks are occurring. Throughout Ohio, I've been involved with the Ohio Coronavirus Wastewater Monitoring Network, where we look for trends in whether virus concentrations are increasing in sewer sheds so that we can determine SARS-CoV-2 in given communities. You can see with the outlines here on these maps that we are covering several different communities throughout Ohio. However, there are big gaps in coverage in rural areas because this wastewater monitoring is best suited for monitoring the population that is connected to a given sewer system. And that brings into this idea of thinking about where wastewater monitoring fits in comparisons with dust monitoring and clinical monitoring of humans. Primary advantages of the wastewater monitoring are that we can tweak it so that we can monitor, monitor a large population at a wastewater treatment plant to get the idea for an entire community. Or like we have done on campus, we can monitor the concentrations in dorms to look at small populations. And this can be easy where we can access really small lightweight manholes, or this can be really difficult when we start to get into these large manholes that we have to have a team of researchers with huge crowbars trying to access these manholes. So that's a con of wastewater detection is sometimes the samples are really hard to get. Another advantage of wastewater monitoring, however, is that it has a great detection limit. We're able to detect one in 100 to one in 2 million people that are sick. So we can detect one sick individual in a population up to 200, 2 million served. So that's a, a great ability to get an early warning of potential outbreaks. Like I mentioned, the difficulties of sample collection can make wastewater monitoring problematic. Also, there are requirements for pre-concentrating the samples and removing inhibitors from all of the other other material like disinfectants and cleaning solutions and organic material that people put down the drain that impact our ability to detect it with these molecular RNA-based assays. 
And finally, because of the mechanism of viral infection of this respiratory pathogen, not everyone sheds the virus in feces. So there can be false negatives where we miss situations where there's a sick person that could lead to an outbreak. And this is where dust monitoring comes in as a complementary strategy to this community level wastewater monitoring, which gives us the ability to monitor a very large population or a targeted dense population at relatively low effort and cost. And it's a sweet spot between that high cost, high effort individual clinical testing method. And that's where the RNA monitoring of dust in buildings comes in. We're able to target potential particular populations, such as those that are at risk in congregate care facilities with this technology. Again, I want to reiterate that detecting RNA in either wastewater or building dust is not indication of viability of the virus. So these data indicate the need of how these are all complementary technologies that can inform in public health interventions, engineering interventions, and where to target individual testing to determine where infections are. Now, and our data demonstrate that building dust is a very, an example of a successful method of monitoring outbreaks to complement the wastewater and the individual testing efforts that are going on. Because of our results and our ability to get them out on a preprint server and come together to mesh our expertise and get this out, this has gotten the interest of commercial companies who have already developed tests where you can get your dust tested already. One example is Eurofins, one example is TRC. And you can see their websites here and you can send your dust out to get tested right now. To summarize and put this in context, we've shown that viruses are definitely present in the indoor environment, and we can use dust as a matrix to detect them. And this is particularly exciting and useful in the case of the SARS-CoV-2 detection in buildings. And to reiterate again, the viability of the virus in these dust samples is still unknown, although we have shown a decrease in viability in these surrogate viruses, MS2 and 5.6. The viability of SARS-CoV-2 on carpet or in dust is still unknown, and it's a question worth asking. However, this dust surveillance data and our viability persistence data begs the question and helps to inform really practical questions answering are there uh, strategies we can use to help keep more people safe such as thinking about the people that clean areas like hotels what if you can just wait a couple of hours to really increase the safety of allowing those team members to go in and clean those rooms that could be a huge implication of this work other practical implications include being able to contribute to that sweet spot between wastewater monitoring and individual testing to get targeted monitoring of viruses in indoor environments. I want to acknowledge that there are several funding sources that built the foundation of techniques for the work that contributed to what we share with you today. Additionally, I want to acknowledge our collaborator, Kyle Bibby, Dr. Kyle Bibby from the University of Notre Dame. Our great team of trainees here at Ohio State, in addition to other colleagues, students, study participants, the carpet manufacturer and the isolation room manager coordinator that helped us get dust samples. Up next, we'll hear from Wilbur Uma, but before that, I want to remind you to please submit your questions for us to the Q&A and we'll get to them at the Q&A session. Over to you, Wilbur. Thank you, Natalie. My name is Wilbur Uma and uh, I'm a senior systems consultant at the Ohio Supercomputer Center. Today, I'm going to give a brief overview of what Ohio Supercomputer Center is, that is OEC, and then talk about our effort to provide support for COVID-19 research. OEC is an organization within the Ohio Technology Consortium, OTEC, and OTEC is a division of the Department of Higher Education. OTEC functions as an umbrella organization for Ohio's statewide technology infrastructure organizations, including OEC. As a statewide resource for all universities in Ohio, we are tasked with providing high performance compute 
and storage services, and also computational science expertise to all universities in Ohio. We also, however, provide these services to commercial clients and nonprofit organizations. At the center of these services are two main compute clusters. One is called Owens and the other one is called Pizza. And all these have about 1,500 compute nodes. Each of these compute nodes is equipped with high speed processor cores and large memory for use. Nodes with GPUs are also available for use. All the nodes are connected with high, high speed InfiniBand interconnect to facilitate accelerated parallel and distributed computing. Our service catalog comprises of the following. Uh, the primary offering at OAC is cluster computing, as I mentioned in the previous slides. And we have mid-range machines that have those, that match those that are available at other national labs. But we also have our research data storage service. And the main goal for this is to provide high performance, large capacity data storage to OAC clients. We are actively involved in education and training. For instance, we provide no cost access to OSC clusters for classroom instruction. We are also actively engaged with our user base through provision of periodic user training workshops. For example, an introduction to supercomputing at OSC workshop. For web software development, we have a dedicated team whose primary goal is to develop and deploy custom web services to simplify use of HPC resources. An example of such web application is the on-demand web portal that is found at ondemand.osc.edu. And lastly, we are equally involved in scientific software development where we help develop and deploy software that run efficiently on large clusters. OAC users belong to diverse fields of study. However, broadly classified, a majority are from natural sciences, accounting for slightly more than half of all the users, followed by engineering with 37% and medical and health with 5%. You can notice that the subcategories of biological and medical sciences result in the largest share of OAC users, accounting for about 20% of all users when classified at lower and more specified subcategories. OAC is currently playing an instrumental role in the fight against COVID-19. Firstly, we are assisting students and faculty by providing virtual computer labs through no cost access to cloud computing and storage services. We also try to simplify access to these HPC resources by providing custom on-demand web portal for access to compute clusters. What I'm showing here on your upper right corner of is the screenshot of on-demand classroom dashboard that provides access to OSC clusters for using statistical applications like R Studio Server or other applications for big data analytics via Jupyter Notebook and also an option for interactive shell access to clusters. These class environments are customized such that students have access to all required software environment and class materials and no installation is required on their part. Secondly, we provide priority access and this is priority access that is unveiled to OSC computational storage and uh, computational and storage resources specifically for COVID-19 research. We have already observed several research outcomes, including the ones that have been presented in this showcase. And we also have a couple of peer reviewed publications that have been citing or acknowledging use of OAC for their COVID-19 research. Lastly, we are involved in public response against COVID-19. As an example, we are hosting the COVID-19 analytics and targeted surveillance system called CARTS. And this system is currently used by more than 40 local school districts to monitor COVID-19. The example shown on your lower right side of the slide is the COVID-19 surveillance system for the Hilliard City School District. And please don't hesitate to contact OEC if you're interested in this or any kind of cluster computing support. I would like now to introduce Dr. Elena Awin, the Faculty Director of the Sustainability Institute.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilbur, and thank you to the organizers of this this event to uh, for the opportunity to speak briefly um, to share some information with you all about the resources um, available through the Sustainability Institute. Um, first, let me just uh, say uh, briefly that the Sustainability Institute uh, has was formed a few years ago and is a university wide institute uh, that seeks to integrate sustainability and resilience research teaching campus-based activities, outreach, and, and engagement uh, across the university in collaboration with many internal as well as external partners. Here you can see our team, a uh, small but mighty team that is uh, distributed across the many different uh, dimensions of the university uh, and how we're supporting research, teaching, communications, campus, um, and other leadership. I co-direct the Institute along with uh, my, crime, uh, my partner in crime, Kate Barter, who is our executive director, and I'm the faculty director for the Institute. Um, the Institute has uh, uh, core faculty, uh, Karen and Natalie, uh, both of whom have shared their tremendous research uh, with us today, are core faculty of the Institute. We've hired a total of 30 core faculty through the Discovery Themes Initiative uh, program. And we, they really are, Karen and Natalie, exemplary of the kind of faculty that we sought to brought, bring to the university in terms of the interdisciplinary research, but not just that, the application to sustainability and resilience topics, as well as the impact that the research is having uh, commercially, as well as in our communities. And, and they've both just done a tremendous job with that. Um, we also have uh, close to 300 faculty affiliates uh, and researchers, and uh, that's an open process. And I'll share with you at the end uh, the link uh, to to uh, share with you in case you are not affiliated and would like to do so. Uh, in terms of our programs and initiatives and uh, resources that we offer, we we have a variety of things that we do. We're always trying to partner um, and leverage and extend and build capacity uh, across these different dimensions of the university and sustainability and resilience. Um, we have uh, several different efforts that are upcoming that I wanted to highlight here today in terms of um, uh, opportunities to grow and support interdisciplinary research and sustainability and resilience. One is specifically on COVID-19 and the recovery efforts to rebuild, renew, and reshape our economies, our society, our communities. Uh, this is a joint effort that we launched last fall with uh, collaboration with Infectious Disease Institute and the Translational Data Analytics Institute. Um, and we started a process in which we invited people to join a series of webinars to talk about their research passions and interests and to start forming exploratory research groups. Um, and that process will continue this spring with additional opportunities for others to become engaged. Uh, parallel to that, we're also launching a, a new initiative called Exploratory Research Groups in which we'll be inviting people uh, to share their ideas with the kind of the kinds of um, interdisciplinary research they're interested in and ways in which the Sustainability Institute can help to support that research. Um, and so in the coming weeks, we'll be launching um, a, a, a web-based um, survey to solicit ideas and to start the formation of, of uh, those research groups. We also, uh, as I said, work across the various dimensions of the university. We have a, a, a fund that we manage on behalf of the NG Endowment Fund for Sustainability Curriculum that supports education grants uh, to develop new majors, new minors, certificates in sustainability. Uh, we just launched this last year and we uh, gave out close to uh, $50,000 in total. Uh, the average award is about 10K. Uh, and went to support, for example, uh, buying faculty out of a course so that they could then develop uh, the curriculum uh, programmatic elements of what they were proposing. Our emphasis is on high demand sustainability areas. So for example, in this past year, we funded um, some work in uh, water science um, and in some new curriculum efforts there, as well as uh, sustainable engineering and race and ethnicity issues in sustainability. We'll be having an RFP come out. We anticipate that late spring or early fall. For, for those of you who have an interest in thinking about new curriculum development, be sure to, to look out for that. We also, as I mentioned, support campus-based activities. This is largely through a fund, uh, the Ohio State Sustainability Fund or OSSF. 
Um, we've enhanced and supported a number of different campus sustainability efforts uh, and awarded uh, significant amounts of money um, over, the, over the years, including $1.8 million just in 2020 uh, to benefit 17 different projects. Uh, we've, uh, I know a lot of uh, the people participating today are from the uh, medical center and, and um, uh, areas. And I wanted to mention in particular several uh, projects that we have funded that have supported efforts there. One in particular was something we funded in, in FY19 to study and implement clinical anesthesia gas reduction in operating rooms uh, at the Wexner Medical Center. The results of this project have just been extraordinary. Throughout fiscal year 2020, the medical center successfully reduced its use of desflurane, an anesthetic gas commonly used in ORs. Uh, this gas is particularly harmful to the environment, however. It has 10 times the global warming impact as its uh, sub closest substitute. Overall, as a result of this funding, the medical center's greenhouse gas emissions associated with anesthetic gases went down by about 46% since the beginning of the program. And because this was a more expensive anesthetic gas, the organization was also able to achieve a cost savings of, a, of oh, just over $100,000 just in fiscal year 2020. Finally, uh, I would like to highlight uh, another opportunity for um, supporting efforts uh, really across the, the board, not just in sustainability, but in some other uh, uh, philanthropic uh, efforts related to leadership development as well as arts and humanities. This is through the NG Axiom um, OS, uh, Ohio State Energy Partners uh, philanthropic uh, dollars. And we helped to manage um, that uh, grant uh, RFP process as well. Um, that funding is just uh, going to be announced here shortly. So the next round uh, for funding will be in, is anticipated in late fall. And there you can see the um, website to look for for additional details there. I promised I would end with uh, just a, a, a information on how to become a faculty affiliate uh, or research affiliate. Um, our affiliates are both from the faculty ranks as well as researchers at Ohio State University. Uh, there you have the link and we would welcome anybody uh, who is doing and interested in becoming involved in uh, networks of people doing research on sustainability and resiliency topics. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to hand it over to Carolyn Cristofoli, who's going to begin our Q&A session. Actually, I, I'm- oh, I'm actually not handing it to Carolyn. I'm handing it to the uh, lovely Bruce Weinberg. Bruce. Thanks, Elena. Um, and I really want to thank everyone um, here, all of our speakers for this, um, for, for all of the great presentations. Um, and I also want to encourage people to add some questions to the Q&A feature in, um, in Zoom. Um, I, and, and I'll say I've, I've been handling the Q&A at these um, for, uh, for, for a number of months. And, and it's really phenomenal because people um, here have provided us some incredibly original and thought provoking work and have done it in, in, in enough time that we actually have time for Q&A and that doesn't always happen. Um, so, um, and I, I guess the last thing I'd say before I have a couple questions, but hope more will come in is um, you know, people who work at OSU and are conducting research at OSU actually owe Karen a tremendous um, debt, I do. Um, because she um, really helped us organize the research recovery um, uh, plan for OSU. Um, but I, let me start with one question um, for Karen, which is to hear about, and really everyone, to hear about what the next steps are for, for this work. And maybe we should welcome all the speakers back. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. Uh, yeah, so I'd love to talk about that. So we're continuing to study viability in dust and on carpet over time. Uh, this is something that we really want to understand and may have Im important implications. So we want to see if that is similar to other materials uh, that we've looked at. Um, one thing that we are looking at now is we are 
trying to get in contact with someone at the BSL-3 facility who might be interested in collaborating to validate our surrogate work on actual SARS-CoV-2. So if you fall into that category and are interested, uh, please reach out and we would love to talk with you. I know all of you are, are super swamped right now, um, but if you do have that capacity, please, please let us know. Great. I think there are um, two questions, one in the Q&A and then another one that I think is related. So in the Q&A, um, what is the mechanism for, for viral infectivity decay over time without the use of disinfectants or surface cleaners? And I think just in general, um, it, another question that I had listening and that I, you know, has been sent to me is, is just, you know, we've been told that, you know, SARS-CoV-2 kind of decays pretty quickly and the idea that maybe it's sticking around in, in, in my carpet here for, for months is sort of hard, hard for me to reconcile. So could you, could you kind of help us think about those two dimensions of this? Sure, Natalie, do you wanna start? And yeah, so a lot of my research focuses on viral disinfection, kinetics and mechanisms in water and these viruses aren't just a single virus out in the environment all on their own. They're actually in water and the amount of water that they're suspended in and the chemicals in that water and the relative humidity in the air and the properties of the virus itself, like whether it has a lipid envelope or the conformation of the spike proteins on the surface and the role that those play in infection, those are all impacted by the environmental conditions. So evaporation and changes in environmental humidity and um, concentration of different ions cause conformational changes to those molecules, which decrease the ability of viruses to infect their host over time. So that would be the mechanism for why we see decay in infectivity, even without any disinfectants on the carpet. And, and to answer your other question, so we did see extended persistence of the viral RNA in our dust samples. Um, and that actually surprised us a little bit too. But if you think about the viral RNA in there, it's pretty protected within the envelope and the capsid as well. And so the envelope and the capsid may become destroyed uh, and the, viral, the virus will lose its infectivity, but you can still detect the RNA that's there. So when we were detecting RNA over that long period of time, we learned absolutely nothing about infectivity. It just said the viral RNA was still there, was still detectable. And that's why we have to have that's why we have to do the second analysis um, of the actual viability and measure that infectivity um, because we're really just measuring that RNA in the center. And to, just to add a little bit more corollary to the wastewater work, it was pretty remarkable that we found such persistence of the viral RNA in dust. In wastewater studies, people have found that it decays pretty quickly because of all the stuff people put down their drain with wastewater. So that was a big difference from our study. That's great. Um, again, let me remind folks to um, to uh, you know to add questions to Q and A. I have one personally that I'd be interested in, which is you know I think uh, Natalie, you made the point that um, that that the that, that these different forms of testing sort of can work out, especially if there isn't a lot. And I guess Karen, you did also. If there isn't a lot of individual testing, I guess I'd be curious. How, how if we thought that we were doing more individual testing, how, how, what role would these types of approaches play in that, you know, if, if we were to adjust in one dimension, how would, how would that affect how we'd want to be using these other tools in other dimensions? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And I think it really depends where we are in the status of this pandemic. As we had said at the beginning, this is really a, a, a study that's looking towards the future as we're moving on to sort of moving past the main outbreaks of this pandemic and we're thinking about this long-term monitoring. And I think in any given situation, you're gonna to need to balance the resources that you have, the, you know, the cost and effort involved in individual testing versus the resolution of the data that you need. 
Um, so in some cases, the wastewater is going to be the sweet spot where you want to measure a large community with low effort. Sometimes you're going to need to do the individual testing, especially if you think an outbreak is occurring, there's no replacement for that. Um, but in some cases, the dust might be the sweet spot where you want the building level monitoring of a high risk target population and you want to monitor over a long period of time um, and you don't necessarily want to put in the, the high cost and effort um, associated with long term individual asymptomatic testing. I also wanted to add, so I, I think a lot about disinfecting viruses in the environment. I think these technologies with monitoring surveillance in dust, they can help us monitor where <clears throat> transmission is occurring and help inform where to put engineering interventions. I study UV disinfection as a type of intervention and we're studying its impact on this virus and other viruses. And so being able to monitor impacts of those kind of interventions and whether they're reducing levels of virus to safe levels will be an important application for this monitoring. Great. Um, one question um, that um, came through is, is whether these methods would help us monitor different variants of the coronavirus? Nick or Nicole, do one of you want to take this question? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so it kind of depends on the specific gene that we could target with these new variants. So ideally, um, with these same methods, if we can target that specific uh, gene difference that changes that variant, we would be able to um, still monitor the variants in the environment, similar as we've been doing for kind of the traditional novel coronavirus. So far, the major variants that we've seen have been due to changes in the spike protein, which is related to infectivity of the virus. And so that means the spike protein gene is having genetic mutations that would impact our ability to detect it with the current assays that we're doing because we're detecting the nucleocapsid gene. So it, it's we're not able to determine with the qPCR technology we're using whether it's a variant, but we're still able to detect all of the variants that emerge. So we're not missing anything right now. Yes, and, and the nice thing is um, this is a, a pretty docile technique. So you could develop a new PCR-based assay to detect either these different variants or even different viruses. Um, so this can expand beyond uh, COVID-19 to other viral outbreaks that you might be interested in monitoring in these same buildings. You just need to develop a new PCR assay uh, for that. That's great. Um, let me, oh, we've got at most a minute, but let me just see if there are any other questions in the Q&A, um, anything that any of our panelists have that you want to ask to each other or to, to say as conclusion before we um, turn it over to Carol and Christopher Lee. Well, I just personally want to thank everyone for attending and for a really fascinating uh, discussion. Oh, it looks like maybe we just have one question that came in um, through the Q&A. Um, will you ever be able to use the actual SARS-CoV-2 for study rather than surrogates? I think that kind of goes back to we would we would love to do that. Um, you do. We are a we have biosafety level two labs. You do need a biosafety level three facility to do that. Um, and so that is something that we are actively looking for a partner or collaborator who might want to work on that with us who has a biosafety level three lab to to answer that exact question. Um, so we're doing uh, what we can now with uh, surrogates, but to use the actual virus, uh, we would need a biosafety level three facility. Um, so great question. We're definitely interested in in learning about that. Great. Um, uh, so at this point, I think we should turn it over to Carol and Christopher Lee for our conclusion, but thank you all very much for a really stimulating set of presentations. Thank you so much, everybody, for having us and, and for the great presentations. We really enjoyed being here uh, with all of you today. Great. Thank you so much for that, um, for sharing your work with us today. I'd like to thank everyone for uh, joining us and a special thanks 
to uh, the presenters, Karen Dannemiller, Natalie Hull, Nicole Renninger, Nick Nast Nastasi, excuse me, Wilbur Oma, and Elena Irwin. Uh, we've got a couple of announcements here from our strategic partners. Um, both the Corporate Engagement Office as well as the Keenan Institute. The Accelerator Award call for pre-proposals is now open. Pre-proposals are going to be due by March 1st at 5 p.m. Any questions about the Accelerator Awards, please reach out to the Corporate Engagement Office. Also from the Keenan Institute for Entrepreneurship, they've launched at the Startup Tree. This is an online platform that facilitates connections between startups and promotes events to entrepreneurs. Any questions about the Keenan Center offerings, please reach out to uh, the Keenan Center for Entrepreneurship. And we'd also like to in extend an invitation to join us next month. This is gonna be on March 16th to hear from Judith Pushkash and her team. They have um, adapted a fiber mat technology that originally they were looking in, are looking into breast cancer reconstruction, have pivoted and are creating um, a Buckeye face mask. So please join us next month for uh, Judith and her team. Also would like to uh, announce a new program name for our program, the CCTS Translational Innovation Program or TIP, Translating Your IP to Market. And finally, uh, we're very interested in your feedback and input and as we strive to continually improve the Inventor Showcase. You'll be receiving a brief survey in the near future, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would take just a couple of minutes to complete that and send it back to us. And finally, this program is supported by the CTSA with the grant number on the screen. We'd like to wish everyone to stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you next month.